Hello again. Uh, <laughs> today's scripture reading is taken from Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. And it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is in the hope what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, let me make sure I'm on this one. Oh, good, all right. Making sure the headset mic is working. Uh, so happy to be here in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. I actually have family um, that live out here, my youngest brother, his wife, and three kids. And so uh, just want you to know every time I'm invited to Scottsdale, Arizona, I always say yes. Just, you know, just a little aside, just, you know, just kind of log it away, FYI. Um, but I've always enjoyed my time coming out here. Um, been here to Thunderbird Academy a few times, and uh, uh, Chandler, and I think there was a there was a camp meeting here I was at, uh, um, and we were in the main gymnasium, I think. Uh, so I've been out here a number of times. I've always enjoyed my stay. I um, want to thank Pastor Zach for his invitation and just making everything happen. And uh, he was a model student at PUC, model student at PUC. Oh, boy. Pastor Zach doesn't seem like they believe me. So I think I need to talk to the church for a little while. Why don't, why don't you step out while we have a little conversation? And, um, so, but it, anyways, it's a joy to see uh, students uh, that are uh, using their gifts, everything that they've learned um, on the campus there at PUC and putting it to work. And so I'm really happy to, to, to see him in this role. Even have another student from PUC that uh, lives in the area, Akil. He's a little, yeah, just come on, just wave your hand. They're in the back. There we go. Yeah, yeah, he's a little embarrassed. But anyways, he decided to drive about 30 minutes to be here. And really good to see you here too, bro. Um, I'm no longer at PUC. Um, I'm now pastoring at the Vallejo Central Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Bay Area in California. Um, what's special about that church for me is it was my grandparents' church when they were alive. So I had a chance to uh, spend time there at that church uh, as a young man growing up uh, with my brothers. Um, so during summer vacation when we would spend time with my grandparents or Christmas vacation. So it was kind of like a home church for me. So when I was ready to move on from PUC, um, I was just hoping that this church would open up. And I'm telling you, God is good because I, yeah, okay. And all the time. And so what happened is that I, I actually made my decision to move on before the church even opened. And, uh, and God just worked out things, man. They're just so amazing. So to be able to be there, I've just been so grateful. Been there for a year, although I've kept it on the down low. I haven't really been saying anything. Just wanted to get to know the church. But now I'm being a little bit more public about it. So that's where I am now, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, had a great time with the kids uh, uh, yesterday at chapel. We talked about Gideon, right? Um, and then last night uh, for the project, the, the love, uh, I mean, hope, faith, love. Faith, hope, love. Oh, doesn't it seem like it's out of order? I always want to say love, faith, hope, but it's not. It's, yeah, anyhow. The hope, faith, love, faith, love, hope. Love, 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 hate. Here we go. So I had a really good time there last night, and so I'm glad that I get to hang out with you this morning. So let's get into the Word of God. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Um, I am using my phone. It's only because it's easier to carry. Uh, it's not less spiritual. It's the same words that are in your pages. Um, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Um, and I hope that's not a problem either. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I had somebody one time challenge me. They said, uh, Pastor, why don't you preach from the King James translation? And I said, well, it's just it's easier for people to, 
to, to hear the more modern translations, they said, well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. I said, oh, okay, you want to you wanna go there? I said, in that case, we should preach from the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. And he said, but, but, but pastor, we wouldn't understand. I said, what about that Holy Spirit you were talking about? I believe the Holy Spirit is, in part, is a part of all that it takes to get God's word in front of us. I believe the Holy Spirit was a part of inspiring the prophets and uh, those who were simply just journaling and sending text messages. The Holy Spirit was a part of that. The Holy Spirit was a part of, of, of writing those words. Um, those, the Holy Spirit was a part of, of translating those words, I believe, into many different translations. And again, if one translation doesn't work for you, then don't read that one. Read the one that works for you. I, I, I really believe that when you read Scripture, no matter what translation you're using, you're not going to walk away and say, well, God told me to hate everyone. I think his word is going to be clear. And if you feel like there's a particular doctrine that's not clear in a particular translation, then use one where it is clear, right? Just do what works for you. Whatever helps you to see God more clearly, to understand Jesus' word, right, more intimately, do what works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, again, find something that does. Man, I've seen, I've seen Bible uh, scriptures like, that are like comic book style. Like, and again, if that's what works for somebody, praise the Lord, right? All right, we're in Mark chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 1. The Word of God says this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. No room left. Not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Verse 3 says, So men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the mat was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he then said to the young man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for an opportunity for us to study your word for a bit. Uh, we thank you for this blessed holiday that we get to experience every single week, this holy day, your Sabbath, that you have gifted to us. So Father, as we open our hearts and our minds to you, Father, we just ask for your spirit to make an impact, an impact that lasts for eternity. Father, that can only happen with you accepting our hearts just the way they are, and you choosing to, to, to give us your, your Holy Spirit, which is a gift. And Father, we already thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. So the Bible says that Christ had come home. He had come home. Some believe this was uh, Peter's home. Uh, some have even suggested this is the home of his mother. Uh, but he had come home. And when the people had heard that Christ had come home, uh, they showed up. And they showed up in such great numbers, the Bible says there was no more room left in the house, not even outside the house. I think this is an important note because often we have been indoctrinated with this idea that the Christian message, the, the, the teachings of Jesus, the, the, the lessons from heaven are kind of off-putting to those who are outside the fold of faith. That, that somehow if we, if we preach the word of God and we, the, the unfiltered, the undiluted uh, word of God, that, that those who are outside, those who are worldly, would not be attracted to the message. But you have to understand, when you read the Gospels, there's one thing that is quite clear. Jesus is popular. Very popular. So popular that wherever he shows up, he packs out the place. You know the story of the 5,000 families that he feeds? We always call it, we call it the feeding of the 5,000 people. But no, Jesus fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. So that means that he was feeding 5,000 families, 5,000 families. And feeding 5,000 families, we're looking at more like 15,000 people. 
And when you read that account in Matthew and Mark and John, when you read this account, it's, it's powerful because Jesus is actually, actually, according to Matthew, trying to get away from people. He had just found out that his cousin had been killed. And the Bible says that he wanted to go to a lonely place. Jesus was grieved. He was hurting. He was sad. And he wanted to get away from people. And the Bible says he went to a lonely place. And this is during the time when there is no social media, right? There's nobody tweeting like, oh, hey, I just saw Jesus passing through. N none of that. So Christ going to a lonely place, 15,000 families show up. I mean, 5,000 families show up. Think about that. He's trying to get away where no one could find him and 5,000 families show up. That's how popular he was. In fact, many times in the Bible says that it was a large crowd following him. The reason why it denotes it as large is because they could not number how many people were actually following. So they just say, just a large group, large following. When they could number, 5,000 men, not including women and children. When they couldn't number, just a large group. There's a reason that when his enemies wanted to take him, they didn't do it during the day. They did it when? At night and late, late at night, like early morning kind of stuff. And Christ says, why do you come to me like this? Oh, I know why. Had they tried to do it during the day, they would not have been successful. Jesus was so popular, so popular even among the Romans that when Christ went through the temple and started knocking tables over and chasing everyone away, did he get arrested? They would have said, nope, I ain't messing with him. That's Jay. That's the rabbi. That's the healer. Man, if he, wants to, if he wants to blow this place up, he can do that. Not the temple soldiers, not the Romans. Even when he, Jesus, Jesus was before Pilate, and Pilate was probably a, very much aware of Jesus, you know, ransacking the temple. Even when he was before Pilate, Pilate's like, I don't see anything wrong with this brother. Like, why do you guys want me to mess with him? Come on, man. You, I, even Pilate, who was notoriously in history an evil, cruel man, didn't want to mess with Christ. I washed my hands. You're not going to put this one on me. There's a reason why Christ was taken in the middle of the night, and he was already crucified by 9 o'clock in the morning. This idea that Christ isn't popular and that his message is not popular is, is, is something I believe the enemy has, has fooled us with. He wants you to think that following Jesus is somehow kind of corny, that following God is just, it's so arduous, it's so difficult. Oh, the cross you must bear. Oh, it's just, there's so much to give up for the Lord just so you can be saved. And I keep thinking to myself, wait a second, I know a lot of people who are not believers and they have crosses to carry. If you live on planet Earth, I don't care if you're agnostic, if you're atheist, if you're Buddhist, you got burdens. You're going through something. You have drama. Life doesn't give you any special favors. If you were born onto, onto this planet, born into this world of sin, it doesn't even matter if you were the son of God, you're gonna go through some stuff. Not even Jesus himself had special treatment. Even John the Baptist, Christ says, was the greatest man ever born of a woman, the greatest of all time, the greatest of all time. And even the Baptist went through some stuff. My point is simply this. No matter what type of system of belief that you want to adopt, no matter if you want to say, I don't believe in organized religion, I just, you know, I'm, but I'm a spiritual person. It doesn't matter what kind of philosophy, what kind of teachings you want to adhere to. I'm telling you this right now. You're going to go through some storms, and you will have crosses that you have to bear. The difference is the cross that Christ gives us is lighter. The yoke that Jesus gives us, his teachings, they are easier. You think I'm making that up? You think I just came up with that on my own? Who is the one who says, take my yoke upon you, take my burden upon you, for my burden is what? It's light, my yoke is what? It's easy. When's the last time you heard that Christianity was easy? Anybody? Anybody? When's the last time you heard that? When's the last time you heard that, that following Jesus, that burden is so much lighter? 
I'm telling you right now, everything that God gives us should make life easier. Everything. No, pastor, no, because loving my enemies is difficult. I'd rather hate them. Let me tell you something. Hate takes a whole lot more energy than love. Hate will keep you up at night. Hate will have you tossing and turning. Hate will have you walking into a room with a scowl. Being being hateful and bitter and holding grudges takes so much mental and emotional energy and takes its toll on your body. When you learn to just release and to forgive and have empathy, let me tell you, the burden is light. You get to walk into a room and you don't have to do this. I don't like her. Why? I don't know. I just don't like her. I don't remember. She did something to me the other day. When you just get to walk into a room and you can just be cool with everybody, it's lighter. Oh, but pastor, but, 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 but concealing and lying and deception, that's easier because you can, you can get out of trouble. No, it's not. No, it's not. Even your body disagrees with you. Anytime someone starts lying, you can tell. The reason why lie detectors can tell you're lying is because your body's like, what are you doing? (laughs) It is so much easier to live life in the truth, to be transparent, to be open, but to hide, to to be in fear. What if they were to find out? What if people were to know? What would they say? They would probably reject me. I'll just conceal. I'll just keep it in. No, let it go. I think I'm, is that frozen? What am I doing? (laughs) What just happened? What just happened? I just. Everything that God gives us, right? His Sabbath day. (laughs) Like, like, this is is, is the the part that's even the funniest for me, right? Right? Because we're Sabbath keepers. We're Sabbath keepers, right? And, and, And we don't even like the Sabbath. And we don't like the Sabbath because we don't keep the Sabbath the way God designed us to keep it. Check this out. Guess who invented the weekend? TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. That is him. He's the one that invented it. No one twisted his arm. After he created everything, he's like, you know what? I am so, oh, this is so good. I'm so happy. I know what I'm going to do. We're going to celebrate this day. And we're going to celebrate it every single week. It's your birthday. I just, I just, you're beautiful. When my son was born, do you know that the very next day, at the exact time of his birth, I celebrated? I kept it holy. Every Tuesday is special because he was born on a Tuesday. It was beautiful, right? Now, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to honor that special day? Why do we want to honor birthdays? Why do we want to honor anniversaries? Where did we get that from? We got it from God. And those anniversaries and birthdays, those are holy days for us. Son, you don't have to wash the dishes. Not today. Not today. Not on your birthday, son. And then we do crazy stuff, right? My son is, you know, we're we're giving him gifts. We're giving him money. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know why we're giving you money. We should, we should, you should be giving us money. We kept you alive for another year. You owe us. But here we are acting just like our creator. Oh, happy birthday to you. It's your special day. It was my wife who put all the work in. She's the one that did all the pushing. She's the one that not just labored for six days, but labored for 28 hours. But we celebrate him. And that's what God does for us on the Sabbath. Pastor, no, we honor the Lord on this day. Well, no, Jesus says the day wasn't made for God. We weren't made for the day. The Sabbath was made for us. That's actually later on in this chapter. We're not going to read that, but that's later on in, in, in Mark chapter 2 at the very end of it. The Sabbath was made for Man, and not man for the Sabbath. So if the Sabbath was made for me, and it was for my blessing, it's for my joy, why do I make it so painful? 
If it's about celebrating, celebrating God's creation, why do we put so many burdens? Well, pastor, we need to be in church all day because God's given us six days to do whatever we want. This day is the only day he asks for. I'm sorry. I don't know who you're in relationship with. Can you imagine doing that with your spouse, with your loved ones, with your kids? Hey, only one day I'll give you. Just one day I'll see you. Relationship with God is not, is not relegated to one day. A relationship with God is throughout the entire week. The only thing that makes this day special is that you don't have to go to work. Yay! But pastor, it's also about worship. We have to come and worship. You know, when you read the commandment, it actually doesn't say that. The commandment just simply says rest. Hmm? In Acts chapter 2, you know how many times they went to church? The Bible says they went to church every single day. Ooh. <laughs> every day they went to the temple. Every day they were in the synagogue. Every day they were in each other's homes. Every single day they worshiped. Every single day it was a community, a gathering, a church-like experience every single day, which makes the Sabbath special. It's you don't have to work. And you can do it as a community at large. You can come together as a community at large. It can be a holy gathering, a special gathering, uh, uh, as Leviticus 23 says. It makes it special because we all don't have to work right now. And we get to come together this weekend and celebrate this experience we've had with God. Celebrate our relationship with God. Cheer and know, yes, we do worship him. Yes, because that's the kind of connection we have. But watch this. Worship is a two-way street. Not only do we ascribe worth to God, but God ascribes worth to us. As his children, as his creation, God ascribes worth to his children. And he says things like this, you are my beloved. Zephaniah 3 tells us that God wants to sing over us with his joy. Now, I know this, is, I know this for some of you, you, you you're, this, this sounds something, something sounds wrong about this. Something sounds wrong about this because we have grown up in a system that is more religious than it is relational. Remember, in, in the Garden of Eden, and this is where we really want to go back to, in the Garden of Eden, there was no church. There was no service. There were no hymns. There was no children's story. There was simply God connecting with his creation. Some of the structures that we have created are a part of our traditional and historical uh, 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 religious experiences. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with them. I'm just simply saying that is not your relationship with God alone. When Elijah wanted to speak with God, the Bible says that a fire passed, a great fire passed by him, and it says that God was not in the fire. Then a strong wind that shattered the rocks, but God was not in the wind. And then an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And then it says Elijah heard a still, small voice. Sometimes our religious experiences, our, our evangelistic series, our church services are nothing more than fire, wind, and the earth shaking. But God wants something far more personal and intimate than this, these experience. He wants that still small, that connection, right? Now listen, I'm not saying I don't want you to get a blessing from this message, but this can't be your relationship with God. This can't be your only connection and experience with God. It must be more because you'll be missing out. Let me tell you this right now. If you are not enjoying your Christian walk with God, if you're not enjoying your Sabbath, if you're not enjoying being in the word and in communion with God, I'm telling you right now, you're not doing it the right way. And even if you, some of you are doing it the right way I and mean, following the blueprints and following it, I'll tell you this, you're not doing it with the right spirit. Everything that God gives us, he says this in, in, in the Gospel of Luke when a woman interrupts his message and says, how proud, how happy your mom must be, the one who nursed you. Christ says, no, how happy is the one who hears the word of God and obeys. Christ talks about happiness being something that's experienced in the here and now. John 17, 3 says, eternal life is that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is not something we get in the end. Eternal life is something we experience right now as we know Jesus. 
When Moses was encouraged to take the people to the promised land, God says, you're going to go without me uh, because these are a stiff-necked people and, you know, we're not getting along, but you go to the promised land. I'll make sure you get there. I'll drive out your enemies. And Moses says, wait, 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 you're sending us, but you're not going with us? He says, I'm not going with you. This is in Exodus 33. I'm not going with you, but you go alone, but I'll make sure you get there. Moses said, no, no, no. If you're not going, I don't want to go. I'm not in this for heaven. I'm not in this for the promised land. I'm in this to walk with you. We're missing something. And this is why I think often the homes that we have, these churches, are not packed to the brim. The Bible tells us Jesus was home, and when he was home, the place filled out. Wherever Christ went, the place packed out. Christ says, if I am lifted up, I will draw how many? All. That is not some just figurative word. This is, not, this is not God just using hyperbole. This is actual truth. If Christ is lifted up, God is so convinced that if Jesus is lifted up, he will draw absolutely everyone. So everyone is not being drawn. The question must be asked, is Christ being lifted up? I believe, family, that when we come to really understand the truth, and let me be clear about this, the truth is not simply a set of words. The truth is the word that became flesh. That when we truly get to know the truth, we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Many of us say, well, no, no, if we know the truth, meaning that we understand the prophecies, we understand uh, the dates, we understand that time is near, we understand that he is coming soon, we are starting to get ourselves together, we're going to get our lives right, and then we'll be prepared. Let me tell you something right now. There is nothing that any of you, not one person in here, nothing you can do to be ready for Jesus. Not one of you. The reason why Christ doesn't give us dates is because dates would not change our lives. If this was simply about a timing issue and being ready, Christ would have said, I'm going to be there in 2021. January, January 28, 2021, I'm going to be there. And I'm telling you right now, even if he gave you the debt, you still wouldn't be ready. You want to know why? You want to know how I know? Because you'd be getting ready for the wrong reasons. The reason why God doesn't give dates is because dates are irrelevant. It's about relationship, not about date setting. That's why he says, I don't even know the date or the hour, and I prefer it that way. I just want to know you, and I want you to know me. You look at the parable of the ten uh, virgins, the five who were wise and the five who were foolish. Why were the five considered foolish? Why were they considered foolish? Many will say they were considered foolish because they didn't have enough what? They didn't have enough oil. Yeah, see, pastor, we got to have enough oil. Auntie Ellen says, hey, I gotta have, more, gotta have some Holy Spirit. That's what that oil represents, right? We gotta have enough oil, you gotta have enough oil. Things we have to do, we have to be ready, we have to be prepared. And so Jesus, Jesus in this parable says, the five who were foolish, when, when the bridegroom comes, they, 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 they wake up. And let me be clear here, everyone fell asleep in that parable, hello? Hello? They all fell asleep, right? But, but five fell asleep, as we would say, prepared. But watch this. Their experience is different than the five foolish in this way. The five wise ones simply say this. You know what? It's possible that he may tarry. We don't know. We're not actually certain when he's going to come. We have, the, we have the wedding invitation. It does say he's going to be here at 7 p.m., but, you know, we don't know. We don't know. Stuff can happen. So you know what we're going to do because of our relationship with him? We're just going to make certain. We're just going to be sure that, you know, everything is taken care of. We're just going to plan for any occasion. We, you just never know. This is the difference between Christians who are, Lord, what must I do in order to be saved? Lord, what must I? Tell me what I have to do in order to be saved. You hear that question? What do, I, what do I have to do? Tell me what I got to do. Just, just, just give, me the, tell, give me the plan. Just tell me the map. Where am I supposed to go? And then there's those Christians that don't ask those questions. They're like Zacchaeus, who's also rich, and does something completely different than the rich young ruler the chapter before. Zacchaeus just stands up in the middle of the dinner with Jesus and says, hey, I'm going to give it all away for Sell half of my possessions to the poor. And then if I cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. 
I'm going to sell half of my possessions, give the money to the poor, and if I cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. How much money do you think he ended up with? But Christ didn't have to ask Zacchaeus what he had to tell the rich and ruler to do. And why is that? Because one was in relationship with Jesus. One was in a special connection with Jesus. One was actually supping with Jesus. And the other one was simply just trying to get to heaven. I'm just, I just want to know, how do I avoid that place that's really bad? So what do I got to do? All right, so I go to church. All right, which day? Okay, that's the right day. All right, anything else? And you know, I can't listen to that music? All right, I won't do that. We can't have drums in the church? Okay, all right, we got that down too. But what is it? Something else we, what do you need to do? What, what do I, just tell me what I got to do, Lord. What do I got to do? Right? These are the people sometimes that are the worst to be around. They're no fun. In fact, they're the ones like on their way to Disneyland, family road trip. Daddy, I got to go to the bathroom. You can hold it. I'm on a schedule. You know, if we, we, we stop and that blue car that we passed is going to pass us. You know, we got to get there. Don't you want to have fun at Disneyland? Yeah, but I'd have more fun if I didn't, you know, all over my pants, but, oh, you can hold it. You're four years old. You know how to hold it. But they're terrible to be around. But that's not our experience as Christians. It's not supposed to be that. Our experience as Christians, watch this, our experience as Christians, we talked about this last night, our trip to Disneyland should be just as fun, if not more fun, than Disneyland itself. Look at you. You're like, that is not true. Because there's no rides in the ride of the car. There's no, you don't, you don't have any of the amusements. We won't be able to watch any of the plays. No, you have one another in the car. Well, what am I going to talk to my kids about? And they don't want to talk to me. Oh, that says a lot about this family, right? You see what I'm saying? The, the thing is, is that we, we're so concerned about the destination that the journey itself is hell. And so there's no joy and no excitement. So this idea of Christ being in the house and everybody shows up, it's like, that's kind of weird. But that's what the experience should be like. Christ wants this to be an experience, that it's life transforming. So that we're not doing this, well, Lord, what do I have to do? No. So we look at the, the, the story of the, of, the ten, of the ten who were um, uh, young maidens, the five who were wise and the five who were foolish. They were in relationship with the bridegroom. It was so different. They weren't talking about what they have to do. They were like, well, what can we do? What can we do to make this experience just even better? Because you never know. He may tarry. And this was the worst part of the story, the five foolish ones. When they wake up and they're like, hey, can we have some of your oil? They're like, oh, man, we give you some of our batteries and we're not going to be able to power our flashlights. Like, it's not going to work. But, hey, check this out. There's a Walmart that's open 24-7. Go there. Grab some batteries if, you, if that's what you want to do, and, they, and then you can come. Now, this is interesting. Now, you, you guys may not want to go with me on this one. You may not see it this way, but this is the way I see it. I'm going to be honest with you. I see it this way. You may not. It's okay. This is my, I'm, I'm not, I can leave after today, okay? You don't have to ever see me again. Right, but this is what I think goes on here, and this is what's so powerful. The five foolish ones, what makes them foolish to me is not that they weren't prepared for the bridegroom being late, because let's be honest, if the bridegroom's late, you almost want to blame the bridegroom, like, it's not my fault. You said it started at seven. <laughs> you, show up, you show up at midnight, the problem is on you, bro. <laughs> but Peter tells us the reason why he tarries is because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. Amen? He didn't want anyone to be lost. So I'm okay with him delaying. So watch this. So watch this. So, so they find out that they don't have enough oil. This is where the mistake is. They go and buy. So they don't show up without enough oil. They try to work their way into the house. They want to show their works. They want to say, see, we were ready. We were prepared, master. Where I think we should have a different response. I think that when we find ourselves lacking, that we go to the bridegroom and we say, we messed up. We were unprepared. But word on the street was, or is, 
that you were prepared for our unpreparedness. <laughs> that you may have some extra oil in your house. <laughs> Can we have some? Now, some of you are like, oh, no, pastor, you're, you're trying to rework scripture. How many times in those illustrations of the wedding does the master or the bridegroom have everything that's needed for the wedding at the house, including the garments we get to wear, right? I mean, if, listen, listen, listen. If it comes down to the end, what do you want to rely on, your works <laughs> or his grace, Right? Because in Matthew 7, they said, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Did we not do all these things in your name? He says, yes, you did, but you never knew me. And I didn't know you. Because if you knew me, if you knew me, you would know these are not the things that you do in order to be saved. Lord, did we not? Did, we, did I not build this church with my bare hands? Was I not the Pathfinder leader for 25 years? Was I not the head elder that, 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 over, that, that outlasted seven to eight pastors? When there was no sermon to be preached, I was the one that picked up that Bible and preached the word to your people. Are I not deserving? And I know, held elder, you're deserving. I know you're, I know you're deserving. <laughs> And I know you did a wonderful job building this church, right? My point is simply this. We have a tendency to want to rely. If the Lord were to tell me, in the end, bro, like, we, we didn't even know each other like that. If he says that to me in the end, I'll kid you not. I will not say, but did I not preach at Scottsdale? I will fall on my knees and I will say this prayer to him. Was not your grace sufficient? I'm going to plead for the mercy of the court. I'm going to grab a hold of his hand. Don't you have the receipt in your hand to prove that I'm yours? Right? Now, you may say, oh, but pastor, this would never happen. But these are the scenes in Scripture. Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is sick. And Jesus goes, keeps walking. No, son of David, have mercy on me. Please help me out. Son of David, please, I'm begging you, have mercy on me. Listen, it is not right for me to help you out. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel, not for you. Son of David, have mercy on me. It is not right for me to take the food that belongs to the children and throw it to the dogs. I'll take the crumbs. Give what you want to give to the children. I'll take the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now please have mercy on me. And then Jesus, who was being all tough, you're not getting into this house. Then Jesus looks at her and goes, girl, you know me. <laughs> you know me. You know I was just messing with you, right? That was just for my disciples, because they were hating. <laughs> Girl, listen, you have such great faith. What you believe, what you want, it will be given to you. And the disciples, their jaws were like on the ground. Wait a second, Jesus, you told her no like four times. Yeah, but she knows me in a way that you don't know me. She was willing to wrestle with me all night long. Even when I told her I was God and to get her hands off me, she says, no, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That kind of boldness is all throughout Scripture. In fact, when Jacob wrestled with God all night long and, 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 and he prevailed, you know what God said? He says, all right, you won, you won. He cries, uncle, you won, you won. And then Jacob gets off of God. <gasps> He says, what's your name? <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> God says, no longer. Your name will be Israel. For you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. The name Israel means those who wrestle with God and win. 
You see what happens when you know him? This is why the house fills up. And those four friends who bring their paralytic to, buddy to Jesus, they know Christ so well that they knew they could rip apart his roof. They just knew it. They were so bold. They came boldly before the throne of God. They just, they just knew him, as the book of Hebrews says, so that we can come boldly with confidence, even in the day of judgment. We can come with bold confidence because we know not our righteousness, we know his righteousness. And so we come boldly before the throne and they rip apart the roof and Jesus is preaching and debris starts hitting him on the head and then he stops, he looks up and they see the hole open and then they lower their friend before Jesus and the Bible says he sees their faith. You wanna know what their faith looked like? Can I show you what their faith looked like? This is what their faith looked like. <laughs> they didn't have to because Jesus saw their faith. And you know what he did? He said, my friend, your, your sins are forgiven you. They're forgiven you, all of them. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, but no, wait, wait, wait. Go to the part where he like he heals them because that's the best part. No, it's not. <laughs> Everybody wants to rush to the end. Just get to the part about heaven. No, no. Heaven's not the best part. The best part of the story is where I'm going to end today. Your sins are forgiven you. No, no, but he, but he was a, remember, he was a paralytic. He just, he, just, he just wanted his legs. No, no. He wanted Jesus. He wanted this heart connection. The guilt, the shame, the burden of carrying his own salvation, the burden of working this out with trembling and fear. All of this was just, it was just, it ransacked his heart. He needed to know that he was forgiven and Christ knew the miracle. He knew the miracle the man really needed. The miracle of getting up, picking up and walk. I mean, that's just, Christ didn't have to break a sweat to do that. But the miracle of forgiving our sins, he would break a bloody sweat. So your sins are forgiven you. Heaven, eh, icing on the cake. Get up, pick up, and walk, yeah, 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 icing. Disneyland, icing. The journey, ah, oh, that's the cake. But there's a reason why I must work these hours. How else would you have this roof over your head? And how else would you be able to buy your Nintendo Switch? And how else would you be able to afford a Thunderbird Academy? I have to work these hours. I'm sorry I can't spend more time with you, but this is what we have to do as your parents. If you're doing everything, all these things for your family, but you're missing out on your family, something about that is backwards. If you're doing all these things, keeping the Sabbath, coming to church, uh, uh, obeying the commandments, reading the spirit of prophecy, uh, 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 adhering to the, the, the health message, all these things, but you're missing out on the heart of the message, which is Jesus Christ, something about that is backwards. More doctrines, pastor. You would be better served to preach more doctrines. This is what doctrines point to. Moses, Old Testament, Ten Commandments, Sister White, they all were pointing to the same place. That's right, Pastor, heaven. No, not heaven, Jesus. Jesus. Auntie Ellen says, I'm the lesser light that leads to the greater light. Yes, the Bible, no, not the Bible, Jesus. The Bible's pointing to Christ as well. All of it is pointing to Christ. So you can continue to worship the shadows that first Colossians talks about in chapter two. You can continue to worship the structures, the system, the organization. You can continue to worship those shadows or you can continue to worship the one the shadows point to. And that is Jesus Christ. 
I'm not saying a shadow still is not cast and there's not meaning behind all of it. I'm, I, I'm saying don't miss the greater part. Baptism is great in the water, but baptism without the baptism of the Holy Spirit is nothing. Communion's great in washing your feet, but if you're just going to wash someone's feet but not love them and forgive them, then who cares that you wash their feet? If you're going to say, I'm going to eat this bread and drink this juice and, and, and do this in remembrance of Christ, but you don't seriously trust the bread of life, then what's the point? The house fills up not because it's a religious experience. The house fills up because it's a relational experience. I think it's fine that you come to church. And if you want to stay here all day, that's great. But if your kids hate it and your family is miserable, at the end of the day, you're doing something wrong. Figure it out. Figure it out. If getting up too early is driving your family crazy, then maybe Sabbath school should be in the afternoon. I don't know, but figure it out. All I'm simply saying is that your Christian walk should not be miserable. And the reward in the end is, I get to live forever. If I hated my dating experience with you, why would I want to marry you? There's someone here today, and I know there are many of you that are like, finish the story, pastor. He, he's able, no, 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 no. I'm not going to touch it. I'm leaving it alone. We're parking right here. I know you with destination anxiety. You just want to get to Disneyland. Stop it. We are pulling over right now, and we're going to let every car pass us because you're going to get this. Your sins are forgiven you. Every last one of them. Even the ones you can't think of. Even the ones you didn't even know were sins. All of those were forgiven at Calvary. Every last one of them were forgiven. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 that while we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were still powerless, he came and died. He didn't wait for your permission. It is for God so loved the world, not because we so loved God, he sent his only son. He so loved you. I'm sorry, I was yelling at you, my bad. I want you to get this. So there's someone here today where destination anxiety, it just, it just encompasses everything in your life and all you care about is getting to the end, getting to the, to the, the finish line. But the actual journey itself, the race itself, has been a miserable experience for you. You don't know Jesus, you know about him, and you want to hear about his teachings, and you want him to tell you about the map, how do you be saved, but you're missing the entire point. You're missing the oil. You're missing the relationship, and, and you want your house to be full. You want your heart to be full. Christ says, I tell you all these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be what? Full, maybe complete. And that's what you want right now. That's where you are. I'm not asking if you want to be saved. I'm not asking if you want to go to heaven. Forget heaven right now. Yes, I said it. I'm an Adventist pastor, and I said, forget heaven at this moment. Can you do that? I want you to think about Jesus. Because heaven without Christ is in heaven. And you're this person right now that's saying, I'm going to take the burden that I've been carrying this race of trying to get to Disneyland so quickly. I've been rushing my own spiritual development to the point where I haven't actually produced any real fruit. It's just plastic fruit. It looks good. It ain't the real thing. And God wants the real thing according to Revelation chapter 3. I want to take my time and remain in Jesus, remain in him. And when we remain in him, what happens naturally is that fruits are produced. Amen? Amen. The only commandment we really need to think about is just simply remaining in Jesus. Everything else is added. We just need to remain. A, br a branch just needs to remain, and that's what we're needing to do right now. If that's where you are, I'm going to ask you to simply stand to your feet as we pray. This doesn't mean if you stand that you weren't a good person and you were, the, oh, everybody's going to look, why are you on the board? And all. Stop, stop, stop. Just you and Jesus right now. You know who you are. 
And there's something powerful about public confession. So that's where you are. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as you pray, as we pray. You're simply saying, I want to have a journey that is joyful. I want to have an experience with Christ that is real. I want to have a type of experience where heaven is not my goal, but simply the icing on the cake. Amen? Amen. Well, you want to have that kind of experience that even if Jesus says, you know what, yeah, that was a misprint, uh, there's no heaven, you'd say, I still want to follow you. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I still want to follow you. I'm not in it for heaven. I'm in it for Jesus. Amen. I'm in it for the relationship with my creator. If I see him at the end of time and he says, he just gives me a good hug, I want a good hug, a long hug. And afterwards he says, all right, I'm going to lay you to rest. I'd be cool. I'm in it for Jesus. Streets of gold, mansions, living forever, going to different planets. Eh. I'm in it for Jesus. Father God, you see those who are talking. You see those who are, who are talking to you right now, wrestling with you right now. You see those who, are, who are, are figuring this out in their head and in their heart. And Father, you see those who, who stood. Father, we realize none of us are good. None of us, none of us, none of us. None of us are good and none of us could ever be prepared. We're just too sinful. We're just, we're too selfish. Even the good that we do, we do for the wrong reason. So, Father, we're going we're gonna to forget this notion that we can be good and simply be a branch connected to the only good tree. We just want to be connected to you. We want to be in relationship with you. We want you in our house and in our heart because when you are there, it is full. It is full of joy. It is full of love. It is full of peace. No matter if on the journey we get a flat tire, no matter if we run out of gas, no matter, no matter if we don't get the treats that we want to eat, if you're in the car with us, the journey is full of joy. Even if there's a cross we have to bear, even if there's a fiery furnace or a giant named Goliath, we just know that if you're with us, that we will have the opportunity for joy and peace, even in the midst of storms. So Father, those who have stood are simply saying they want something real, something authentic, something even better than heaven. We want you, for this is eternal life, that we know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Father, as we close this prayer, may moving forward our experience be more filled with joy. May the Sabbath actually be happy. May the water that we drink satisfy our souls so that we never thirst again. These things we ask in Jesus' name, let everyone say amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Amen.